It's the fall of 1888, the location, the fog-filled streets of the East End of London. We're talking about Whitechapel, where a series of brutal murders lit a flame that sent shockwaves through the civilized world and caused a scandal that struck right to the heart of the British establishment. Here on Fake News CSI, we're going to pull out the fake from the facts. <laughs> Welcome to Fake News CSI. Oh, I'm Fryers Bash. Let's start again. I'm new here. I don't want to do it. All right, let's go. Welcome to Fake News CSI. I'm Fryers Bash. And I am Lucy Arden. And what we're going to be talking about is going to become obvious, isn't it? Yeah. So we all know the term fake news. I'm assuming that because I'm speaking to people in the modern world. And in the modern world, that is a term that's bandied about in press, in media. Yeah, what does it actually mean though? Okay, well, it's kind of in the name, isn't it? Fake news. We both, we know what these two words mean. Yeah. It's news, but isn't necessarily real. It's kind of like a pseudo news, alternative facts. Hoaxes, is a kind of news that's deliberately made to spread disinformation, would you believe? I guess with this whole rise of social media recently, yep. we've actually seen a rise in this fake news, more than ever. Uh, so we want to find out what was fact and what was fake about the history of the world. And we do know that it's been weaponized a little bit. Fake news, the idea that, hold on, that's not true, that's fake news. That's reporting designed to mislead, right? Mm. But it's been going on a little while, this, hasn't it? This well, isn't just a modern thing. No, 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 not at all, exactly. Centuries old. I mean, arguably, from the first time man was able to speak, he was able to lie. Yeah, so, and tell stories. Exactly. Embellish. We love, good, we love a good story. Yeah, even if you embellish, like, say, you're a caveman and you, you had a little scrap with a, a lynx cat. Yeah. You're going to go back to the cave and say, I oh, just, there was a saber-toothed tiger outside. I think we all do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, because it makes you look good. So, you know, that becomes a mythologized experience. Oh my God, he, this is the dude, he fought a saber toothed tiger. And all it was was a little cat scratched him. All right, all right. That was one story. But there's some stories that last the test of time. Mm -hmm. They go on and on. There's one, isn't there? There's one in particular. Yes, we're talking about Robin Hood. No, we're not talking about Robin Hood. <laughs> we're talking about. It's, but it's not dissimilar. It's something that's, that's deeply entrenched in the British psyche. And then obviously, there's a global phenomenon now. And uh, when we think of serial killers and we think about who is the original serial killer? Do you killer? know we're talking about? It's the one that you can buy tours to find out where he did his murder. It rhymes with Flack the Flipper. Who could it be? Uh, write in, please. No. It's, it's, I'll give you a secret. It's, it's Jack the Ripper. Yeah. You may or may not have heard of him. Mm. He's been around a little while in our public psyche, as yeah. you say. And uh, we think that there might be some answers in the past that we can go and delve into to find out whether this guy actually existed, who he was, and whether it's fact or fake. Let's get on to the business. Let's do it. We're going to cover the five canonical victims and by the end come to a conclusion about how much of this story was true and how much fake based on the experts we've lined up. In 1888, London was the world's largest capital city, yet right on its doorstep lay the district of Whitechapel, a crime-infested quarter vice. Violence and drunkenness was out of control and 76,000 residents lived in poverty. The East End really was outcast London. Out of, sort of 1,129 families, 871 of them were living in rooms, just one room big, and up to nine people per room. Known as the Abyss for good reasons, particularly in Whitechapel, the slum-ridden warren of overcrowded lodgings, gangs roaming the streets, became the place where the authorities thought that revolution was likely to kick off. And it's made worse when you've got this gulf between people who've actually got anything and people who haven't. It's turning into a yeah. revolution. Superficially, the empire seemed strong and the authorities in control. But underneath this thin veneer, there was a fragility to the order which something like the Ripper murders could quickly strip away. A revolution going on in the British Empire, the all-powerful, totally yeah. got this under control British Empire. It's the latter days, things are starting to crumble. Yeah. It's not what it once was. Sounds familiar, you know? Yeah, yeah, history. Who has it said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes? Oh, I didn't history know somebody rhymes. said that. Sounds yeah. like a Shakespeare thing. Yeah, but it wasn't. But... If things are that out of control, what is mm. it that's driving everyone? Is it just because some people have got things and others haven't? Well, that's what it will be, wasn't it? it? Well, at least one of the things, the discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots. So close together, we've got this central empire of power in mm. the middle of London, and then right there on the doorstep, or the back door, as you call it, we've got 
Whitechapel. Yeah, they're close enough to witness. Delights. The, yeah, the elite relishing yes. in their wealth, but their reality is very different. What was it like there, do you think? I mean, they, they didn't have the benefit of he uh, health care and education, opportunities, no. it's misery. So, of course, that's going to just breed unrest in people, right? Why would you expect them to just be cool with that? It's They're not so be cool triggering, with that. yeah. Of course, yeah. So we've got the same thing going on now in this area of London? I mean, or is it a bit nicer? Now it's like the most desirable location to live in London. Of course it's nicer we have. But then again, the standard of living has collectively risen. Mm. So, But that doesn't necessarily close the gap between the rich and the poor. You know, it just means, okay, so now poor people have internet and TVs, but they're still yeah. far less privileged than the privileged. But yes, it was a very rough area. Um, street crime, petty thievery. I mean, there were several streets known as the blackest of the black streets, um, including Thrall Street, where Polly Nichols was living at the time. And policemen wouldn't go down those streets unless they were in groups of four. That's how rough these little streets were for street robbery. Despite frequent violence in this part of the East End, murders were uncommon, and the killings stirred up genuine revulsion in the area. And later, that fear infected the whole of London. Murder was actually quite uncommon at the time. Apparently the year before, there'd only been half a dozen murders the whole year. So obviously to have such a high level of crime, so many murders in literally a few weeks, it really did cause a huge widespread panic throughout not just the East End, but the West End too. I mean, women would not go out um, after dark in the West End. And those who were forced to go out in the East End, we've actually got reports of them actually carrying guns and knives to protect themselves. But what do we know for sure? What's fact and fake about the place? Yeah, okay. So we know it was a poverty-stricken area, yes. not great to live. Yes. And in fact, you'd be crazy to choose to live there in 1880s. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be living there by choice. It's not like someone would say, hey, listen, I can offer you a house anywhere. Yeah. Oh, okay, that, yeah, that abyss looks good. That's what it was called, right? the abyss. So, yeah, the press weren't making up the fact that it was no. actually dangerous out there. No, no, no. There could but have they, been any they, that didn't need, no one needed convincing of that anyway. Yeah, we you know? know that for a fact. Yeah. It's a terrifying situation to be living in, particularly mm. in that area of London, let alone cities or, or the, just trying, people are just trying to survive. Yeah. yeah. And Motor rate was high, we know that. Okay, people were there not by choice. People were crammed in. Yes, it was an unfortunate circumstance for them. And so I don't think it's um, hard to understand why a revolution mm. would be stirring. Made worse mm -hmm. by the fact that the revolution is stirring. Yes. I know by the sounds of it, it's like things have basically gotten completely out of control because there's such a disparity between people who've got stuff and people who haven't, the haves and the have-nots, I suppose. <laughs> You had all the different fears and anxieties and this kind of social fear, really, of, of things that were going on, the changes to the ordered society that the middle classes and the upper classes were, were so used to. And it was a, a period where a lot of people were frightened. That there was a genuine fear of, that there was going to be a revolution. The East End came to be the focus of all of that social anxiety. Jack the Ripper came along, in many ways became the physical embodiment of all of those anxieties. So there's this unrest, that's the picture, this is the fact. There's this unrest, there's this uh, major divide between the rich and the poor, an overriding success, uh, sense of injustice. Yeah. Because let's be honest, the people who had, they were in the minority. It was a small minority who had, who had you know, privilege. And the people that had wanted to hang on to yeah. what they had. Naturally. And absolutely not share it out. Mm -hmm. So what then happens? in this climate. There was a very large Jewish community in the East End. There had been a, a huge immigration into the East End. The immigrants were, were living in a way that was different to the, to the Gentile population, and a lot of the Gentile population resented that. This led to racial tension. There was not enough for all to share, but there was one thing they all shared, the daily battle to survive from one day to the next. So that's the status quo, right? Things are falling apart. Mm -hmm. We've got our background. So what are the newspapers going to do about this? This is the world in which the mythology of Jack the Ripper was able to kind of mm. gain momentum. Ah, our first suspicions mm. that it's mythology. Well, we're, we're going to go into... This is the whole point. We're going to, you know, decipher fact yeah. and fiction. We are the sieve. We will. We will know. We are the ultimate answer. Yes. Let's well, explore further. I want to know what, what this guy was. If, maybe he wasn't even a guy. Why, why, why bring that assumption into it? We haven't you even know, gone there we, yet. We thought we were guys. Yeah. It could have been anyone. Okay. Jacqueline. 
Officially, there were only five Jack the Ripper victims, although there were two other murders that happened before that of Polly Nichols, which most history books considered the first Jack the Ripper murder. Um, the murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith in April 1888 and that of Martha Tabram or Turner in August 1888 are considered by some people to have been the early sort of works of Jack the Ripper. Apparently, there were 11 murders on the Whitechapel murder file, which bore a resemblance to the Ripper modus operandi. But was this the first, or was it just the creation of Inspector McNaughton, who just said there are five victims, the canonical five? The early crimes, the pre-canonical five murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith and Martha Tabram, are sometimes included in with the, with the Ripper murders, and, and sometimes they're excluded. Emma Elizabeth Smith almost certainly wasn't. She appears to have been the victim of a street gang. Let me get my numbers straight. How many murders have we actually got by fact? Five. What are they called? Five murders. The canonical... The canonical... Five. Five. So I should remember that. Mm -hmm. It could have been a lot higher than it actually was because there were so many murders going on at the time. Mm -hmm. But how are we to know which ones were Jack the Ripper? Of course, yeah. Or which ones were... Your everyday yeah, slip yeah, throat yeah. kind of thing. Because the thing is, what had a life of its own? Was it the serial killer going on a rampage? Or was it the imagination of the people? Mm. I think the legend of Jack the Ripper, we call it a legend for the moment, is it's much more interesting when you consider it. It's the legend of the legend itself, which is interesting to me. Yeah. Because it says something about us all as human beings and the way that we can embellish in a singular narrative. And, and for what purpose? What, for what reason? Because you're absolutely right. There could be different... Murders are not linked, whatever, but we're making the connections. We are, in well, our we, minds. We love the story, don't we? We yeah. want the story to build. We want, we sort of love the mm -hmm. mystery and the conspiracy. Okay, so in this climate, the first thing happens. Yeah. There's that first murder. It all began in Bucks Row, Whitechapel. Polly Nichols was discovered by Charles Cross, a carter who claims he was walking along Bucks Row when in a gateway he noticed what he thought was a bundle towards the western end. It wasn't a bundle at all, but the body of a woman lying there between life and death. Another carter named Robert Paul, who was with him, approached the body with Cross. Police officer John Neal eventually arrived on the scene. Nichols was found on her back. Neither of the men had noticed that her throat was cut so viciously, her head had almost separated from her torso, and she'd been ripped open with great force and effectively gutted. This was the event which began what the press were to call the Reign of Terror. Yeah, there's just this heightened hysteria going around. Everyone's getting really scared. Right, yeah, in the midst of this hysteria, in the midst of people living in this highly adrenalized state, yeah. Right, because when you're hysterical, you're not you're not being rational, and you are more suggestible to fear. And so the newspapers are naturally going to capitalise on this. They just seize this, and they're like, "Now's our moment to make the big sales to get think... some sort of story." Is what they need. They're seeing this unrest, and they're about to create what is soon to be, you know, the biggest story of all time. The question yeah. is, did they know it was going to be such a big story? Okay, but here, okay, is that a fact though? Because I, I'm interested in the idea that, okay, fine, what we know is we're talking about a different time where police, detectives, they didn't have the benefit of forensics as they do today. But also, why assume that the tabloid culture was what it is today? Maybe, why assume that they, are, where they were just as calculating then as they are now? I'm not saying that they weren't, but I'm just saying it's tempting to think, okay, well, maybe it's all a ploy, but perhaps they were just a victim of the hysteria just like anyone else. And the journalists, to what degree were they orchestrating a fiction? Because the journalists are citizens too, right? Yes. Living amongst this exact context. Exactly. But if anything, the newspapers are reflective of the time. Reflective, exactly. So they begin to, okay, maybe the wrong word capitalised, but they begin to reflect this yeah. in a more obvious way and people are buying into it. So mm -hmm. something is born, our yeah. first murder occurs and Jack the Ripper as a legend or truth begins. Mm -hmm. If the Ripper could step across the border from the poverty-stricken, immoral East End and infect the rest of London, then so could all of these other nebulous fears spill across and bring about an awful lot of social unrest and social change. But the fact is that 
that it did penetrate the consciousness of the people in a way that an ordinary murderer hadn't done in the, in the past and would never do again.